Hi, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm the Director of Business Development here at the World of Code, which includes Code Magazine, of course, but also Code Consulting, Code Training, and Code Staffing. Code everything, it feels like sometimes. The registration numbers for today are the highest we've had since starting our monthly State of .NET online series. We have Code Magazine subscribers in here, some of our consulting and software development clients are here, as well as people completely new to the code world. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Don't be shy now, jump in and ask all your questions in the chat window. For those of you who don't subscribe to Code Magazine, you won't be non-subscribers for long. As a benefit for attending, based on the email you registered with, we're going to be setting up free Code Magazine subscriptions for all registered attendees who don't already subscribe. Okay, down to business. Our presenter today is Marcus Edgar. For those of you who have attended our previous webinars or have seen him speak at conferences or have attended any of our training courses over the years, you're familiar with Marcus. For everyone else, Marcus is the big fish around here. He's Code President and Chief Software Architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft Regional Director, and all-around good guy. He'll be ready to start in just a moment. We here at Code pride ourselves on helping people build better software. We build turnkey custom systems for some clients, modernize legacy applications for others, and support and maintain existing applications as well. We can help with whatever platform you're targeting, whether it's a cloud application, an on-prem solution, a web application, a mobile app, or a Windows desktop application. Our team of expert developers and consultants can help with your project. Got questions? Maybe you're not sure what technology or platform to use for your next project. Perhaps you'd like some guidance about what client-side JavaScript framework to use. Or maybe you, have questions, maybe you have questions about developing for the cloud. We'd be happy to spend an hour or so on the phone with members of your organization answering your team's questions and providing guidance. No charge, no strings, no commitment, no credit card. Just free help from our code experts. Of course, we'd love for you to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We're always looking for talent to join our software development teams or to write for the magazine. Check out these links if you're interested. Need additional developers to fill out your development team? Code staffing can help there as well. Just a reminder that .NET Conf is right around the corner, November 10th through 12th. It's a free Microsoft event focusing on .NET 5 that will be packed with .NET 5 sessions. Microsoft has announced they will be releasing .NET 5 at .NET Conf. Finally, we'd like your feedback about the webinar, and we're willing to put up a $100 Amazon e-card for one lucky attendee. The survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. Make sure you get yours filled out by this Friday night to be entered. It's almost time to turn things over to Marcus, but before I do, I want to share with you that the slides and recording of today's webinar will be available on the State of .NET page on the Code website. You'll see that URL all over Marcus's slides. Okay, that's it for me. And I know Marcus is ready to go, so take it away, Marcus. Thank you, Jim. So hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, great to see that we have a huge turnout today. Awesome to see that these events uh, receive great feedback. Uh, I think you got about 25% more people today than we had on the prior one and uh, it keeps growing, so it's awesome. Uh, we've now been doing this for a while. Uh, hard to believe that when we move to this online format, rather than doing this event in person as we used to do, we started with an introduction essentially of the .NET 3.x platform and a general overview of that, and now we are already moving on to doing a completely new generation, a huge step forward in the world of .NET and, uh, and uh, it's good to see that a lot of people are as excited about that as we are and I think rightfully so because this is going to be a very very interesting step for .NET to take. So let's take a look at the agenda and what we're going to talk about here today. Let me get my slides moved forward here. There we go. So we want to take a look at .NET 5. I want to give you a good overview. This is also uh, called the .NET 5 preview event. And the reason it's the preview event is that .NET 5 is not yet released. As Jim said in the intro, there's going to be a .NET Conf on November 10th to, uh, through the 12th. So November 10th is the official release date of .NET 5. And so we're going to give you a little bit of a preview of that. 
I'm going to talk about new platform features and improvements. In a, in a lot of ways, .NET 5 is what you would expect from a new version of .NET. However, uh, as you can see, the name changed a little bit. We went from .NET Core 3.x to just .NET 5. That implies kind of what's going on, which is a, a big leap forward or a, a big paradigm shift, um, at least behind the scenes. So it's an important step. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at the gradual improvements, but we'll also take a look at, at the big changes. Now, when we talk about .NET 5, that goes hand in hand with the tools and the languages that you use to build it, in particular C Sharp and F Sharp have big language improvements specific to .NET 5, and you need .NET 5 to get those language improvements so you couldn't use the latest C Sharp compiler to compile for, say, the full framework 4.8. Um, so that goes hand in hand and really is one big release together. Now we'll talk a little bit about web development improvements. That's going to be a fairly small part of today's talk. Uh, we did look at web development on the Microsoft platform in the last event. The recording of that is still available. So we'll just give you a little bit of an update on that. We'll take a, a little bit of a longer look at desktop development improvements and uh, into that also flows mobile development, which are really kind of the same, similar rich client development environments these days. But the biggest part today I'm going to spend on just overall platform and uh, what's new in the world of .NET in general. Now, we'll do this preview event, then .NET Conf is going to roll around, and then afterwards we'll do another event. I'll let you know about... Uh, the date of our next State of .NET event, which is coming up a little sooner than it normally would. And that's where we kind of recap and dive more deeply into some of those areas that we'll cover today, because there's just too much to do it all just in one event. Um, now, I will at times look over here to my right. Uh, I have Ian being kind enough to help me out with the questions online. If you have questions, feel free to ask him at any uh, time. I will try to monitor the questions and, and answer them as they come along and, and as they fit in. Uh, we already have a first question where uh, the question is, is .NET 5 kind of a new .NET Core 3.3? Well, it's a lot more than .NET Core 3.3, as we will see here as the presentation goes on. Uh, but you can think of it as a continuation of .NET Core 3.3, but then you can also think of it as a continuation of other flavors of .NET being unified back together. So let's dive right in and let's take a, a look at the overview of .NET 5. And the big mantra, the big vision for .NET 5 is 1.NET from desktop to web, mobile and IoT and the cloud and, and everything beyond. When you look at how .NET developed, we originally started out with .NET as the framework that ran on Windows, the platform that ran on Windows. And we eventually, we had that for a long time, but then eventually we moved beyond that. Uh, and we saw .NET appear in other places. We saw UWP applications that were really a different .NET runtime. We saw the Mono guys doing cross-platform uh, .NET development even before Microsoft got into that. And we saw the Samarin guys before they, which was a continuation of the Mono project, uh, before that got rolled into Microsoft. Then we saw .NET Core as a cross-platform version of .NET. Uh, so .NET started to kind of scatter into different similar but not totally equal .NET runtimes and platforms. And that was important because the original .NET, also known as the full .NET framework or the original CLR runtime, um, really kind of outgrown what it was made for. So .NET Core set out to fix that. And in that were things like better support for the cloud, better modularity, being able to boil uh, an, a .NET application down to a smaller package, being able to run different versions of .NET side by side, running on Linux, running in containers, and so on. Uh, so that's why .NET Core was super important. And then being able to build for mobile on iOS and Android through the Xamarin platform, that required its own runtime. Uh, then we saw, as recent attendees of the State of .NET online events know, we saw Blazor, which allows us to run .NET code inside the browser using this WebAssembly binary standard. Uh, which is yet another runtime based on top of the Mono project. So we had all these different flavors and those are all great because they serve very specific purposes. And, 
And they solved a lot of problems, but they introduced others. And we were aware of those, but that was just kind of the, the cost of doing business, so to speak. So one of the problems we had was that when we wanted to share code between those platforms, it was difficult. And so we came up with things like .NET Standard 1.0, which, which defined a, a standardized .NET minimum that was available as far as APIs go. And if you stuck to that standard and it was tools that helped you with that, then that code could run across the different platforms. So that was nice, but it was too limiting. We then came up with .NET Standard 2.0, which was much more useful, widely used today. And just about any flavor of .NET can run that particular standard. So that was good, but it still had other problems like when a new API got introduced, how did you introduce it in all the different platforms? How did it get into .NET Standard? That was a huge and slow process. And so this vision started to grow that .NET should really be reunited, that all the best bits and pieces from the different .NET flavors, whether that was performance we got from IoT device optimizations to new APIs to side-by-side -side capabilities to the ability to, to shake assemblies down and build small packages that would run efficiently to uh, even the ability to target specific things like mobile platforms, like Windows, like uh, specific web standards and so on. So that was the original vision was bringing .NET back together into that one unified platform that supported all these things that we now have in those different uh, platforms and then being able to develop APIs and standards rapidly and continuously and all in one package. And that in essence is what .NET 5 is. You may have heard of .NET 5 referred to as 1.NET. I'm putting it on my slide here as 1.NET from desktop to mobile and beyond. But that 1.NET actually was a term that people used to refer to this next version of .NET before it was called .NET 5. Um, so that in a nutshell is it, a unified version of .NET. Now a lot of that, hopefully, you won't even notice so much. As you build a .NET Core app or a .NET 5 app or a Windows app, you shouldn't notice that behind the scenes a big evolution is taking place and finally we're getting close to achieving that goal. But it is, of course, uh, hugely important from a runtime uh, point of view and code reuse and investment into the future, future that you're making with this platform. Um, so there's questions uh, online. Let's take a look at this. Uh, one is, uh, are the three versions now the same? Uh, Linux, Windows, uh, Mono, I guess is the other question, Mac OS. Uh, yes, that's uh, exactly what this means. They're really back to being one runtime that exists everywhere. Different question is, is WCF dead? Our app is based on WCF. That's really a little bit of a different question than what we are uh, exploring here today. Um, WCF is not dead because the full framework is not dead. However, WCF has never been converted uh, to the latest runtime and .NET Core environments and thus not to .NET 5. Now there's some community projects going on that are looking to do just that, but it's not a trivial endeavor. So we'll see what comes of that. But right now it's not included, but it still runs, it's still supported. The full framework doesn't go away. It will continue to be supported with every Windows release that it ships with, uh, and therefore it's still around like that. But yeah, it is in a sense, almost a little bit of a dead end. So I wouldn't start a new WCF project today but I wouldn't panic if I had a WCF project. In fact, we actually used to run a lot on WCF with our internal infrastructure and uh, recently converted away more to JSON and, and REST platforms. And because of our architecture, that was actually very easy to do. And, and I'd be more than happy. Like Jim said, if you have any specific questions about any of the stuff I'm going to tell you about here today and you wonder how does that apply to my specific project, we'd be more than happy uh, to do that hour of consulting or half an hour, if it's longer than an hour, so be it uh, free of charge to explore how this works for, you, for your scenario and to see more and more people are taking advantage of that. Uh, another question is, is WinForms dead? No, absolutely not. In fact, I have a big segment on WinForms here today, probably the biggest I had in, in any talk in a while. So uh, you'll be happy to hear that it's not at all dead. Um, 
We have another question. Should we migrate all standard libs to .NET 5? We're getting ahead of ourselves here. I'll be um, looking into that as one. I have a specific slide on that. Uh, the answer is it depends. Sooner or later, probably yes, but it depends on where you, uh, where you are at today. Um, all the best bits included inherently means uh, bits left out, someone says, and functionality lost. So if, uh, if someone is using 4.x capability that's not in 5, is there a choice other than freezing forever? Uh, well, the good news is what we are looking at here is a continuation of .NET Core 3.x. So in a sense, we're looking at the next generation of .NET Core. And so there's absolutely nothing lost from .NET Core. And .NET Core has been fairly feature complete as far as backwards compatibility uh, with uh, the full framework. So WinForm, SAML, and so on, those things got moved forward. But yes, there is some details that are essentially .NET 4.8 technologies. Uh, for instance, uh, web forms development in the old style ASP.NET that we had in, in .NET 1 and .NET 2 20 years ago. That still works in 4.8, but I don't see that being migrated forward. There's some stuff around system uh, dot drawing that's not being moved forward and we'll see how that goes but those are now fairly small and and not huge stumbling blocks in general um, so but yes the, the aspect in general is true but if it didn't hurt you in 3.x then it's not going to hurt you now and it's gotten better since then so definitely much more feature complete um, so what else? Uh, what about runtimes maintained by third parties like Unity? Well, .NET standard still applies there. And now, I don't know what the Unity guys are going to do. The goal certainly is to bring them onto this new platform, and I'm assuming that's what they'll do, but I haven't seen any, uh, any recent announcements. Uh, there's a bunch of questions about WPF. WPF is not dead. There is uh, uh, stuff that I'll talk, talk about today. It runs in .NET 5, there's new features. Uh, Entity Framework, uh, there's a new version, EF5 uh, Core for .NET 5. So that's alive and well. I'm not going to talk about that here today. I just don't have enough time. I'll probably talk about more that more in next month's uh, presentation. But that's alive and well. Uh, but yeah, it's a different version of, of Entity Framework and uh, ha is lacking some features, especially on the designer side. Um, anyway, .NET Core Apps to .NET 5, piece of cake, it's just a continuation. Uh, we'll talk about Blazor. Anyway, so we have a lot of questions. I have to move on, but we'll get to all of them, I promise. Uh, but I see people have a lot of specific questions. There's a lot of interest, um, and, uh, and that's certainly good to see. So let's talk about this journey to one .NET, to keep, to keep using that term. Um, it's been a long road, you know, .NET looks back at a history going back to basically 1999 with the, with the earliest betas. Lots of twists and turns. We know that there were lots of different runtime environments. Uh, today we talk mostly about the full framework .NET Core, Mono and Samarin. There's a little bit of UWP, Silverlight, most people forgot, Windows Phone, most people forgot. But all these platforms had good aspects that we all want to bring forward. And with different project structures, different UIs. Again, the goal is to grab all of those and unify them into a single target that is .NET 5. So, so that's what this is all about. Now, this is now being called a journey by Microsoft. Uh, if you heard about Microsoft talk about .NET 5, say, at build a year and a half ago, .NET 5 was going to be the one .NET. And... To a large extent, that is the case, but the journey is not yet completed. So there certainly are still loose ends that need to be tied up. And this will take a little bit longer. And, and so as always in software, things take longer than you think. I think this journey will uh, take us from .NET 5 to .NET 6. But in the big picture, for the large, in, in large parts, this uh, has been achieved in .NET 5. But we'll talk about .NET 6 as well. Um, so here's the overall vision that you will see Microsoft talk a lot about. 
rather than having uh, all these different runtimes that we would have seen in earlier versions of this particular uh, chart here, we now have everything just based on .NET 5. So that is the compilers, the languages, the runtimes, they all compile to this one runtime environment that is .NET 5 that now runs everywhere. So whether you run on the Mac, whether you run on Linux, Windows, we kind of had that with .NET Core, but we didn't have it when it came to Samarin. We didn't have it when it came to certain devices. And uh, all of that has now been unified. .NET 5 is at the core. It's compatible with .NET Standard. It's a continuation of .NET Standard. I think this .NET Standard term is going uh, to go away a little bit. But, it, but that is what it is. We, we just won't have to worry about it anymore. So I think that's why you'll see that term disappear. But if you have targeted .NET standard in the past, it's a continuation of what you have done. So you're in really good shape. And then on top of that sits all the stuff we want to build. Of course, there's going to be web, ASP.NET, Blazor, all those things. There's going to be the cloud, all the points that we've made about how well .NET Core runs in the cloud. That is still there. But now we have desktop development that started with .NET Core 3.x, where WPF and WinForms were brought along uh, onto the .NET Core runtime environment. And that was a hugely important step because if that wouldn't have happened, we would have lost those tools. A lot of people say, well, why would I move my WinForms app to .NET Core? What do I gain? Well, what you gain in short is a future. WinForms and WPF are fully supported on, on .NET 5. They're first class citizens. They'll move forward. They'll get access to all the new API, APIs, all the new improvements. Also, for desktop development, we have the UWP platform or WinUI as it's also often referred to now. Uh, and that platform is what, what used to be called Windows Store applications. And while those are not necessarily lighting the world on fire, there's very, very interesting technology in there uh, and we can now use that and we can use it everywhere. You can combine it with WPF and Windows Forms and therefore improve the, the capabilities of those applications without completely having to convert them. Then there's the Samarin platform for mobile development. There, there's still some development going on there. There's the whole new uh, MAUI, Microsoft Application User Interface platform that the Samarin guys are building for building uh, rich client desktop applications. That will be very interesting, but work is still going on in those areas. That's probably going to be more of a .NET 6 type of uh, feature set that's going to be coming out. We got Unity that's supposed to be on .NET 5. I don't know how far they are. We got the whole ARM runtime environments with IoT devices, with new laptops supporting ARMs, things like Raspberry Pi. And .NET 5 has received a lot of optimizations to run on top of the ARM platform. And then, of course, there's everything to do with AI and machine learning, ML.NET, MachineLearning.NET, uh, other uh, AI platforms. And all of that, again, is to run on top of this new or continued from 3. Point, uh, core 3.x, uh, this new platform and, and runtime. Okay, what else? A new a bunch of questions. Uh, is uh, is this the push to do everything using the .NET code environment? And, and the answer to that, I think, in short, is yes. Uh, the question is: It easy to migrate to .NET five? Well, the answer to that depends on where you're coming from. If you're coming from .NET Core, then it's a no-brainer. It's just a continuation of that. So a specific question about uh, .NET Core three point one going to .NET 5, that's super easy. If you're coming from WinForms uh, or WPF, it's not that hard, but there are some differences, uh, but a lot of those apps just can be recompiled. Um, uh, is C-sharp going to be continued as the main supported language? Well, it's the main business application language, I would say. Uh, so that's a big deal. Uh, there is F-sharp, of course. I'll talk about that a little bit today. and it's, uh, analytical programming and, and data science and machine learning is becoming more and more important and more mainstream for all kinds of applications. F sharp is also considered one of the main language. Um, so that's uh, an important aspect. There's a question about VB.net. I don't have an answer for that. Let's see what they announce at .NET Conf. I know that 
there's a big VB community out there and Microsoft has a big interest in not losing those people. Let's just, uh, let's just put it like that. But I am not at liberty to really talk about anything there or, or know any specific uh, timelines for that. Um, is CPU specific code relevant in .NET 5 like x86 based code? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you can specifically target those platforms if you have reason to do so. Now, of course, you're trying to build code that's as generic as possible, but you can certainly uh, try uh, or do specific things for those platforms. More common than uh, x86 or, or a 64-bit environment uh, is probably targeting specific ARM-based environments for IoT devices or specific Linux builds and so on. But yeah, you can absolutely do that uh, if you have a need to do so and still have access to APIs only available on those platforms. Um, another question here that I'm going to move on. How fast is it, basically? Uh, it is the fastest .NET that Microsoft has ever built. And that is one of the things that we got from, the, from this uh, merging of the different platforms. Because if you have a .NET platform that runs on an IoT device, of course, performance optimization is probably super important, while maybe on the cloud it's more scaling optimization. Uh, but so we got things from the ARM platform and, and a lot of those optimizations. Uh, the Mono guys had a lot of optimizations that we gained. And so in short, this is the fastest, most nimble .NET platform we ever had. And sometimes those improvements in certain areas are truly uh, significant. So that's actually one of the big things about .NET 5 is the performance tweaking and the improved, um, uh, the, the size improvements of the assemblies, the deployment size, the runtime footprint, and, and just pure computational performance uh, is, is good. Okay, uh, I know there's a few more questions, but uh, I'll move on and I'll get back to them a little bit later. So let's take a look at the timeline and the roadmap for .NET. And, and I included a little bit from the past because significant things have happened in the past. So last year, November 2019, uh, was the release of .NET Core 3.1. Uh, and that was an LTS release. That means long time support uh, versus general availability, which is what we have with .NET 5 now. So Microsoft is moving, uh, since this uh, .NET Core 3.1 release, is moving to annual releases in November. So every November, we will now see a new release of .NET. So this coming November, .NET 5, next November, .NET 6, then 22, it's going to be .NET 7, November 23 is .NET 8, and so on. Uh, every other version will be a long-term support version, while the in-between versions, uh, the odd-numbered versions, essentially, will be general availability, but then merged into the long-term support once the next version comes out. What does that mean uh, to you as the developer? That means .NET 5 will have good support, but eventually it'll merge into .NET 6, which will be compatible, which will be an easy migration from .NET 5, and then that has truly long-term support. Um, so in, in practical terms, it means very little. These, these major versions are all very well supported. Now, there will be minor releases in between. Uh, I believe they're talking about a six-week cadence for releases. We'll see how that turns out. That's a little bit of uh, as-needed type of thing as well. So there will be in-between releases, but these are going to be the major releases. Now, people always say, well, what happens uh, with my .NET uh, Full Framework 4.8 application? Well, that's going to be supported long-term. It's part of Windows. Uh, the Full Framework ships with every new version of Windows. And therefore, the uh, support lifecycle restarts with every release of Windows. So you will have long-term support for that. Microsoft will fix, uh, say, security problems, things of that nature, uh, but don't expect any significant updates. So as new things become available, let's say a certain Azure feature that you want to use or a certain API that you want to use or new operating system features that may become available, those are going to be on the .NET 5 uh, and 6, 7, 8 platform 
while uh, 4.8 is, is just, it is what it is, right? It's an old version and it's nice that it's gonna be supported for a long time to come, but the old version is the old version, it's not gonna have the new stuff. Um, question online is, should we consider adopting uh, .NET 5 just next year with version six because it's not an LTS version? I would not be worried about that. Uh, it just means that .NET 5 to .NET 6 will be a, a very easy and straightforward migration and there's going to be little reason to not move at that point and uh, .NET 5 won't have as long a support but it doesn't need it and 6.0 is going to be that the, always the, the even numbered versions are going to be these big milestones that Microsoft will um, support for a long time to come but I think in practical terms that's going to make uh, very little different uh, difference. So another question about UI controls. Uh, will Xamarin and WPF uh, or a new set of UI controls merge? To some extent, that's already happening with .NET 5. So we have things like WinUI 2.0 and SAML Islands that are widely available across the different uh, technologies such as WinForms and WPF and, and that will continue. So we are going to see WinUI 3 as kind of an in-between thing. It's not quite ready for .NET 5, but uh, same overall time frame, uh, which is going to extend that even into C++ and other things. So we do see that. We'll have to see what the Maui guys announce uh, from the Xamarin team and and tune in to .NET Conf. There might be announcements about that. I'm, I'm not pre, uh, uh, in the loop on that uh, myself, but certainly the general trend goes, uh, goes in that direction. Uh, is .NET 5 compatible with Windows IoT? Yes, it should be, is the short answer. Um, there's a question about a graphical entity designer. So I'm assuming that's entity framework related. I'm not aware of a graphical designer for that. So for things like entity framework, everything goes more towards code based designing. Some people love that, some people hate it. Uh, personally, I would like to support the people that hate it more than we currently are, but it's not, realistically speaking, it's not the trend that we see happening. We see that more and more goes towards Visual Studio Code. And that code-based designing is what people want to do. Uh, I have mixed feelings about that, but um, I, I don't have any say in that. Um, question about uh, Java, integrating Java bytecode assets. Uh, you could do it at a low level. I've never done it myself. There's nothing specific in .NET 5 that helps with that. NuGet package is a question. Uh, they are compatible with .NET 5. Um, 2.2, 3.1 projects are, are compatible, uh, I guess 2.x. Uh, HoloLens support, yes, uh, should be with Unity and UWP, I believe. And .NET Native, I have no updates. Uh, so we'll see if Microsoft announces anything about that uh, at .NET Conf. So anyway, let's move along. I see there's a lot of questions. Um, and that's great that people engage in this a lot. I'm happy to answer those questions, but uh, let's also move along. So as you can see, a lot of these questions that I'm answering, uh, sometimes I just don't know. Sometimes I can't say, but I encourage you to uh, tune in to .NET Conf 2020. It's free, .NET Conf .net. Uh, Three days packed with information, basically going on all day. Our own uh, Otto Dobertsberger, who's doing a lot of Blazor development, is a speaker at this conference. Uh, should be a great event. Uh, really encourage you to take a look at that. Another thing I wanna point out is we're actually working on a focus magazine for .NET 5. Uh, we've done this together with Microsoft. Most of the authors are Microsoft authors. So it's a great source of information. This is free to current subscribers. Uh, it's a physical print magazine, but it's of course also available online. It's gonna be available in the Code Magazine reading apps. It's gonna be available as a PDF. Uh, so it's free of charge. I'm not trying to sell you anything here. 
Uh, so it's just a great source of information straight from the horse's mouth because a lot of people that wrote in it are Microsoft people straight from the individual tech teams that worked on those features. So all the subscribers are going to get that. If you are sitting in a Stata.net event, we will send you a, a free subscription anyway, so you're already getting that. But if you have friends who, who would like to have access to this, uh, feel free to share this URL that's on the screen here. It's our regular subscription URL uh, with CF2020, uh, code focus 2020 at the end. It's easy to remember and it's just a free subscription and if people sign up, we'll send them a copy of this magazine for free. Uh, first come, first serve. Uh, we only have so many, but we, we are printing a very large print run. So hopefully we can send one to everyone. Now, before we dive into some samples, uh, one quick thing I need to point out to you to, to, to go along with the samples I'm showing you in this presentation, you need the preview version of Visual Studio 2019. That is, it's a little bit confusingly named. It's really not a preview to 2019. 2019 is already out. It's, a, it's the preview that comes after uh, 2019. Uh, I guess it should really be called Visual Studio 2020 preview, but nobody wants to name any product 2020 due to the crappiness of the year, I guess. Uh, so it's called Visual Studio 2019. Download the preview version. That then allows you to target .NET 5. And uh, I guess it'll come out a preview once uh, .NET 5 officially releases. So let's talk about the platform. Uh, so what's going on here? In general, uh, rather than building an, a, a project that targets .NET Core uh, or .NET Standard uh, or .NET Standard 2.1 or anything like that, we now just target .NET 5.0. .NET 5.0 is what you'll pick in your project dialog and uh, that's what goes into the project file and that generates essentially a .NET Standard uh, DLL uh, or assembly exe. Okay, so it's very similar build to building for .NET standard, but it's now just this unified .NET 5.0. Now, if you are using specific things that only work on a certain platform, then you can target that. Like for instance, you can say .NET 5.0 dash Windows. That targets the standard plus Windows API surfaces. And this will be extended in .NET 6. You'll see other uh, additional platform like .NET 6.0 iOS, .NET 6.0 Android. That's coming from the Samarin guys. Um, right now, we just have .NET 5.0 for Windows and Linux and, and those kinds of things. Um, so think of this as the next version of .NET Standard. And if you've built for .NET Standard, you pretty much know how that works already. Okay? So if we switch into Visual Studio here, I have Visual Studio 2019 preview running and in my project here you can see that I built a simple console app here so this is, is uh, as simple as it gets just uh, plain vanilla template but then in my project file here in console app 1 I changed the target framework to net 5.0 and that's really all you need to do uh, especially if you're coming from .NET Core to target your project to 5.0. And now it will really run everywhere. Uh, if this is a DLL, you can reuse it everywhere and it just targets this new platform. Now you can also do that by going to the properties and in here picking your target framework. And so typically you'd have it at 3.1. Uh, that's what we used to do if you're building a .NET Core app uh, up until few days ago basically and now you also have this .NET 5.0 target framework available to you. So that's what you'll what you'll target and of course I can hit a 5 and it compiles like always uh, and it just runs but now we'll have a, a essentially a cross-platform console application. So pretty simple pretty straightforward now we'll see later that not everything works through this uh, UI through the right-click properties dialog. We'll see that we can add more attributes like this one in here uh, But for the simple things that's really all you need to do to move to .NET Core 3.0 and, and Now you can think of this as a, as a .NET Core app. You can think of it as a .NET Standard app both ways of looking at it 
are essentially correct. Uh, so we talked about that. Um, now the question that always comes up and we kind of already answered it a little bit today is what version should you target today? Uh, .NET 5 is fully backwards compatible with .NET Standard 2.x, uh, so including 2.1 for instance. And that means you can build a .NET 5 app and you can use a .NET Standard 2.x assembly and it's fully supported, which makes a lot of sense because it's a continuation of .NET Core 3.1. Okay? The reason you would target .NET 5 is to get access to newer APIs. In a sense, think of .NET 5 as a target as .NET Standard 3. It's not correct in terms of the version numbers, but conceptually, that is what's happening. Uh, but then, of course, you're limited to platforms that support this new .NET Standard version, if you want to think of it like that, and that's only .NET 5. So .NET 5 targeted DLLs, for instance, only work in .NET 5. But you could still, if you wanted to target a larger reach, target.NET Standard 2.0, for instance, and then that is the largest possible reach you will have today uh, in the different versions if you need to support backwards compatible things. Now, the full .NET framework, as a side remark, 4.8, the, the old full Windows framework, if you want to think of it like that, is Standard 2.0 compliant and will not go beyond that. So if you're building standard 2.1, uh, then that's never going to work on framework 4.8. So if you want a real large reach, at this point you can still target standard 2.0. We do that a lot because standard 2.0 is, is quite feature complete. So for a lot of middle tier things, business type of code, uh, things that drive services and APIs, we just target standard 2.0 and that's fine for the time being. Now, if you ended up targeting standard 2.1, you might as well just target 5.0 at this point because 2.1 is, is not as widely supported. It's more of the modern thing that only targets the more modern environments. So if you were on standard 2.1, just go to 5.0. There's really not much of a reason to stick with 2.1. And as time goes on, I think uh, it won't be that long before 5.0 will just be what we all want to target. Uh, but right now we're kind of in this in-between time and we are still happy uh, also targeting .NET Standard. And it's just not that big a difference. The two are uh, a continuation one to the other and should. Uh, uh, it's not like you're way outdated because you're targeting Standard 2.0. Now you do sometimes still have to uh, deal with platform issues. Uh, the goal, of course, is uh, to create code bases that work in all kinds of scenarios. Okay? Uh, that was the goal with .NET Standard 1.0. Uh, it was uh, then discovered that 1.0 was very, very limiting. And so out came .NET Standard 2 and then 2.1. .NET Standard 2 was very good and supported a lot of things you had to do. But .NET 5 uh, exposes more. But sometimes truly doing things that are only available cross-platform are just, uh, just too limiting. And therefore, there are some things in there that only work on certain platforms. So for instance, a, a typical example would be access to the Windows registry. That is supported in .NET 5, even though it technically is not a true cross-platform feature. Now, the people that need this all the time and just want to build for Windows don't care. They just want a functional .NET 5 and not be forced into some, some beyond the standard type of feature set. So it's supported in .NET 5, but it won't work on, say, iOS because they don't have a registry there. So what Microsoft has done is they were a little more liberal in what they support in .NET 5 and give you a really good design time experience where the IDE points out to you when you're using things that are not truly cross-platform compliant. And then you have good ways to say, oh, but I don't care because I don't need this. Or there's ways to code around this. We'll probably dive into this more in, in the next state of .NET. But just so you're aware, that's what we're dealing with here. It's, it's trying to give every developer and every platform a truly pleasant development experience that's not super confined for the sake of cross-platform when maybe they have no interest in doing cross-platform. 
Uh, so it's, it's trying to strike a good balance. But then there are some things that are truly so special that instead of just targeting .NET 5, you then target .NET 5 Windows or iOS or Android or whatever. Uh, and the examples of that are Windows Forms or, or WPF or, or UWP apps. I mean, those are Windows specific features and, and it's thousands of API features and, and they're not all in .NET 5 as the smallest common denominator. Uh, so a question is, can you reference a .NET 5 standard library in a 4.x project? And the answer is no. Uh, that's, if you go beyond .NET standard 2.0, uh, don't go to 2.1, don't go to the .NET standard after 2.1, which is what .NET 5 is, you can't use that, right? So stick with 2.0 if you need to target uh, full frameworks. So if you have an old web forms app that just also wants to access uh, the standard library you have, then stick with 2.0. So let's get into the features that are being introduced other than this unification of the platforms. One of the things that I, I think is really cool in .NET 5 is the reintroduction of single file applications. So one of the things we had in the full framework was we could create relatively small apps, say a WinForms exe, or a small web app or something like that, a console app perhaps, and just take a very small file, put it on any Windows machine and just run it. And we kind of lost that with .NET Core because in .NET Core, the assumption wasn't that the framework of a specific version is on the machine. We, we made no assumptions about the platform, whether it was Linux or some Windows or, or a completely different platform. And so what happened is you really had to deploy, deploy relatively big packages uh, with very often lots and lots of files. Um, so what we can do now in .NET 5 is we can go back to that. We can create single file applications that include everything that the app needs to run. So you can build a Windows app and you can make it so it runs self-contained. You can actually make an EXE put it on a USB stick, stick it uh, into a Windows machine and run it from the USB stick. And whether it has .NET installed, .NET Core, .NET 5 installed or not, that EXE has everything uh, that you need. And this works particularly well for web-based applications. So if you're building a small web-based application, say targeting Linux, you can Compile that web-based app into this single file, creates a single file executable. Uh, you can X copy deploy it. And the cool news that is really works nicely in .NET 5 is that it performs this feature known as assembly trimming. Assembly trimming essentially looks at all the assemblies that your .NET 5 application references and, and really looks at what you're using in your application and then as a first step pulls in only these assemblies that are needed by your app. But then it goes a step further and it looks at what are you using from within that assembly. And it then takes only the types that you use in your application, performs a tree shaking and only includes those and then compiles all of that together into a single executable file specific to a target platform. And then uh, you have a, a, a very small file, you could containerize that and, and that works really well. Now that is supposed to work, of course, for all kinds of targets. So whether you're building a Linux web app, whether you're building a, a web app for, you know, that you want to put in a Docker container, whether you're building an IoT type of app, whether you're building uh, a WPF or a WinForms app. Now, not all those platforms work equally well currently and this is a little bit of an ongoing journey works really well for um, uh, web-based applications works reasonably well for WinForms app WPF still has some problems to work out because it does a little bit too much trimming and you have to fine-tune that but uh, it's really nice uh, what we have right now and this will continue to get better and better and be more and more optimized um, let's take a quick look at a sample of this. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this, but I did create a sample. And this sample uses a Windows app. Yes, 
And so what I have here is a .NET 5 app and this .NET 5 app targets specifically the Windows subset of .NET 5. And that's really all you have to specify if you want to build a WinForms app. If you build a WinForms app in .NET Core 3 or 3.1, it was well supported, but you had to do a few things on your own. Now all you have to do is you set the target framework and then we can go ahead and run this application. And as you'll see, it'll just pop up a, a very simple Windows application. Okay, and here it goes, it compiles and it packages and it takes a little bit longer than it would if uh, I built just a regular WinForms app because uh, it builds this packaged single file application. Now this here is Windows Forms running in .NET 5 and it does everything that you expect it to do. Um, but because I specified that I want to publish a single file, it creates this single file application. And I can say, do I want this truly self-contained with all the runtime files built in or do I want this to run on a box that has the framework but all of my files as opposed to be just in a single file. I also have to specify the exact runtime I want to target because it's pre-optimized and pre-packaged for this target. So if I built this single file app, that's say a console app, then I would want to build different targets for Windows and Linux and so on. Um, and then I have this publish trimmed feature and this is what performs the tree shaking and, um, and, uh, and then really only includes the things that you need. And this results in a drastically smaller uh, compiled version of your application. And, and so that's very cool. If we looked at the output folder right now, we would see that there's actually four or five files in there. It's not truly a single file. We do the same for uh, WPF, it's even a little bit worse. Uh, if you do this with a web app, then it's truly already a single file app and this will be uh, improved and will get a little bit better as time goes on. Uh, a few questions again. Will Azure support .NET 5? Yes, it does, uh, is the, sh the short answer there. And then with this feature I just showed you, just about anything does now, right? As, as long as it's a general platform that supports .NET, so any Linux or whatever. So you can just deploy this uh, single file app into anything. Uh, will there be lightweight versions of the framework running for Docker? Well, again, this is essentially what that does. Right, it boils the framework down into very lightweight packages, uh, but there's also different Docker images that you can already pull in. Can you use .NET 5 in Visual Interdev? Uh, you probably could if you uh, compiled in a runtime uh, CLI type mode. Reflection, uh, same dynamic, still supported, same as .NET 3.1. Can you use .NET 5 objects in Python? Uh, yes, you can, but I'm not the expert in this. So uh, probably not the best person to ask the details about this. Assembly trimming with reflection is one of the big problems. Uh, so that's why WPF doesn't work so well right now. And then you'd have to fine tune that. Uh, what's the size of that EXE? It's a few, the EXE is a few K. Uh, the total deployment package uh, if you do the self, the fully self-contained is, in this case, not that large because all I'm doing is popping up a message box, but you will have uh, a few hundred K, I think, for typical apps. Native x86, yes, uh, should be able to do native interop and pull those DLLs in. Not sure how it packages it up, but I, I believe that works. I'd have to try that. Uh, those properties right now, the ones that I showed here, these have to be set in uh, the project file directly. The UI does not support this. I don't know if the Visual Studio team will change that or not. Is it going to be a good language for creating games? Uh, uh, Raf the man is asking. And the answer is yes, uh, because Unity is becoming very, very popular or has become popular for a while now. And so you can do development on top of Unity with this. So um, 
that's very good. Do WinForms app on .NET 5 run on Linux? A question online is, and the answer is no. WinForms is based on GDI Plus technology. GDI Plus is Windows only. Uh, the same problem applies to WPF, which is based on DirectX. Uh, UWP is specifically based on uh, Windows 10. So those rich desktop applications are specific to Windows and that hasn't changed because they call through to operating system features that are just not available on those other platforms. Uh, however, we may hear more about that uh, in the .NET 6 timeframe with stuff coming from the Samarin team, but we'll have to see uh, how that works out. Just really quick, I wanna talk about ARM, ARM64 specifically. That's a very interesting platform. Uh, more and more devices are based on ARM. I know we've been down that path a number of times. It kind of ebbs back, back and forth. But certainly we now see more laptops being based on ARM. We see that Mac is going the ARM direction. Surface Pro X is ARM based. Um, other laptops, lots of phones, IoT devices often have ARM based chips. Raspberry Pis often have ARM based uh, chips. And so it's important that it works very well in ARM and they have been a ton of improvements for targeting ARM as a platform. Okay. Um, another area that's been improved greatly, I don't have the time to dive into that a great deal here today, is just improvements around JSON as that is a very important platform. So performance improvements, uh, also making it easier for people that came from JSON.net to go to the new ch built-in JSON features and uh, a few other things like deserializing chase and do records. It's just, uh, as an FYI, I picked that out as an error. I mean, there's lots of areas I could have picked out that are interesting improvements, but that is uh, one uh, that, that I thought was important enough. Um, question about better support for side-loaded Win 10 applications. Really, .NET 5 doesn't change the security model. and. The Win 10 applications, they actually come from the Windows team and um, at least I have not been aware of them loosening the security standards, let's put it like that. So yes, it is a pain to sideload UWP apps and that's uh, certainly one of the big hindrances around UWP and, and we don't see that much adoption of UWP apps to tell you the truth. So. And in a, can a .NET 5 NuGet package be consumed in .NET Core 3.1? Uh, no, it cannot because it's basically the next version, right? So .NET 5 gets consumed by .NET 5 and later. So if you have to consume it in 3.1, uh, make it uh, .NET Standard 2.1 or earlier, which we still do a lot for, say, middle tier components. Now let's talk about languages. Uh, this is an interesting area of improvement. Uh, we could talk hours about that in itself. I just want to point out a few interesting features and developments. So we have C Sharp 9.0. C Sharp is just a compiler, people say. If you add new features to C Sharp, you could theoretically target any framework uh, version that you wanted. But in, dot, in C Sharp 9, that is not the case. C Sharp 9 is specific to .NET 5 because it depends on some of the features in the .NET 5 platform. So it releases together with .NET 5, it's joined at the hip with .NET 5. Uh, so as soon as you target something uh, like 3.1 or standard 2.0, the C Sharp 9 features go away. And there's some really nice ones in there. Uh, one that I wanna point out kind of as a warm up feature is top level statements. Uh, in C Sharp 9, Microsoft is trying to make it easier to get into C Sharp for simpler, smaller scenarios. If you want to build something very small, uh, which often is the case in uh, a lot of these service and, and AI type of scenarios, or if I just want to play around with an application and, and start getting into it, right, which is an important aspect as well, then Microsoft aims to simplify things and top level statements is one of them. And what top level statements does is it takes this code example that I have here, which is the default console app that you'll always see, which has a main method that's a static entry point with a bunch of strings, a string array being passed along as an argument. And it's in a 
class called program in a certain namespace. And when you look at this, this these 10, 12 lines of code, there's really only one line of code in here that's particularly interesting, and that's the console.write line. Uh, line. And maybe you could argue the using system because that's what gives us access to the console object. But the fact that this sits in a main method, not particularly interesting. fact that's in a program class, probably nobody has done anything with that in particular. Uh, so that's not very interesting stuff and therefore we want to get rid of it. And that's exactly what Microsoft has done. So in this new world, you are free to just write the same code like this. So if, the if there's no namespace, if the static entry point is not there, the compiler just assumes all of that. So these two code examples are literally identical down to the fact that in the simplified version, you even have an args array that you could access. But it's just a simpler way to get started and, and that's kind of nice. Now you can still build a complex program from there out, it's just the entry point has been simplified. So that's nice to know, like I said, kind of a warm up feature. Now the thing that I really want to draw your attention to is record types. This is actually a very cool feature that, that I've been kind of waiting for, for, for quite some time. Uh, what is this all about? Well, this is about introducing a new type of type, if you want to put it like that. Uh, currently, we have two different types in C sharp. One is a reference type and the other is a value type. A value type would be something like an integer uh, or a decimal, the, the simple things that we store, the simple kinds of objects. Uh, and then there's the reference type, uh, a window, a person, a controller, the, the more complex object that we're building, the classes. Uh, so those are two fundamentally different type structures that we have in the system. And they have implications as to how they're handled, like a, a value type is uh, memory managed different from a reference type, but it's also used a little different. If I say x equals one and then y equals x, I copied the value from x to y, and now I can do with that what I want independently, but x still exists and I can change them independent of each other. They, they are value types, they're copied. While a reference type is different, if I have a person object in memory, P1 is a new person and then say P2 equals P1, they're really pointing at the same object. That's the nature of reference types. Uh, and now with record types, we have a new kind of structure that we can create. And this structure is immutable. And immutability is very important when it comes to parallel processing. So with all this async stuff we are doing, uh, immutability is important and, and this type gives us a very nice structure that is immutable and easy to make immutable. Just out of the box, so we have easy cloning of these objects, we have value style comparison. Uh, so if I have two person objects in memory, they're typically only considered the same if they're literally pointing at the same in memory object, while if I have uh, two, X and Y, uh, as integers both storing the value one, I can compare them and if they're both one, they are the same even though they're two different allocated pieces of memory. So record types make that a lot easier and I created an example for that. So let's go ahead and open that. And so here is my sample application. Now this is this this is program.cs I have here in my sample. And you'll see this already uses this new ability to create the simplified structure. I didn't create a class and a main entry point. I just said go ahead and write some code and compile it and and it just works. So what am I doing in here? Well, I'm creating a person object and I'm initializing it with two values first name, last name, and then I'm echoing out what this does. So let's just grab this, let's get rid of the other code for now, comment it out, and let's take a look at what this person is. So here's this person class. It has a first name and a last name. It has a constructor, and in this constructor I'm passing in first and last, which is what I'm calling up at the top. Um, and then I'm using this syntax that was introduced a little while ago, uh, where I'm basically taking these two parameters first and last and I'm assigning them to the properties first and last. 
Now these properties are read-only properties, but because I'm in the constructor, I can set them. And then from that point on, this object is immutable. Now what's different about this object is that it's not a class or a struct, but it's a record. So it's public record person. That's kind of like saying public class person, but make it immutable and, and do all these new things that the record type gives me. But up here, I just use it very similar to any other record and, and I can go ahead and run this and this creates a console application. And you'll see that it does pretty much exactly what you would expect it to do. Here is my console window and it created the person object. Then I did a console.write line on the person object and note that it has a little bit of a special uh, to string behavior where it actually echoes out the data that is in that person uh, in this somewhat proprietary, well, echo output format. Uh, slightly JSON-ish, but not totally JSON. So, so that's kind of the, the starting point. Now, if I try to go in here and I say p1.firstName equals whatever, uh, this would spark a compile time and a, and a design time warning because this object is immutable. It's meant to be not changed once it's initially created. If I want to change it, I actually create a copy of it and then work with that. And that makes it much more thread safe and easier uh, to work with. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these other examples that I have here. So I have another object here called a teacher. And this object again is a record and it's down here. So this teacher record inherits from person. So it just like classes fully supports inheritance. I added one more property called subject and I gave this uh, constructor another parameter and I'm calling the base constructor with uh, the, the general stuff and in addition I'm assigning the subject. So this works pretty much like you would expect it uh, where Oh, now I can construct this object and then it echoes out the properties from, from all these objects. And of course I can uh, create two of those guys. And now I can do some interesting things. Uh, I can compare those. So is the first person, this guy, the same as this person here? And that will be false. Why will that be false? Um, because they're two different people and one of them has the subject and the other doesn't. Uh, so this teacher teaches genetics, makes it different from this first person. And besides, the names are different anyway. So it compares these two guys and says, no, they are false. But it does so by a value-based comparison. So it goes through and it compares the different properties. And it also, by the way, compares the type. So even if this teacher didn't have this property at all, it would consider them different because such is the nature of records. Now these two objects here that are two completely different objects in memory that are both set the same way. If I compare those two guys because it's just a value based comparison will return true because they are in fact identical even though they are different objects. So as you can see this is very good for dealing with data structures. So loading a record into memory from a database and then working with them it's easy to, be, to compare two different records and so on. So that's, that's kind of interesting, right? That this works fundamentally different from how classes and therefore reference types work. So it behaves much more like a value type, which is nice because now you have the choice as to uh, how you would like to deal with them. Uh, what would it return if your teacher had the same name as the first person? So if I did say this, uh, then it would still be different because it has the subject, but even if it didn't have the subject, it would actually still be different because it's also based on the name of the type. So just because a teacher is a person, in comparison, it's always considered different. Okay. Now let's say I now want to deal with this guy here and say, okay, well, so we initiated him and, and he is a professor of genetics, which is true for Otto, but he's also a professor of computer science, so I want to change um, the subject to computer science. Well, I can't do that because the object is immutable. However, what I can do is this new th operator that we have. I can say create a new p4 variable 
and base it on P3, but create a copy, create a clone of P3, but while you're at it, change the subject to computer science. So now I have a new object in memory. It's a copy of the object and it changed the subject. So that's how you can change the state of these objects, even though they're immutable. You just create a copy and assign some new things. So this new with keyword allows us uh, to do that. Now, if I compare the two, they're now not the same anymore because the subject has changed and, and on we go. Uh, now, there's an interesting detail here, by the way. This subject, in order to do this, it has to be writable at some level. And in fact, if we come back down here to the teacher class, you'll see that this subject property is readable through the get, but it's also writable through this new init uh, modifier. And init basically is a setter that is only settable while the object still initializes, which is exactly what we're doing here. So init en enables uh, that, okay? So just moving along here, a few more examples. Uh, what's kind of cool is you can actually short define, there's a, a shorthand syntax for this. If I define a new record and then I immediately specify parameters like this and then have no further body of this, meth of this record, this also creates these three parameters as properties. So this is identical to creating a record with these three different properties. Somehow my mouse got stuck, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So that's kind of interesting. And finally, you can add methods to these objects as well. Uh, so there are still classes in that sense and support all the features that classes do. So that's cool stuff, right? These, these record types are, to me, one of the biggest new features in C Sharp and super useful in business applications especially. We talked about the init-only setters. They work everywhere, but they're specifically useful in record types. Um, what else do we have? Well, we have enhanced pattern matching. Pattern matching has been introduced in C Sharp before, but it is now enhanced. And I got a list of things uh, that it does. I'm not going to go through any samples, but uh, you will get the slide deck afterwards. So I, I wanted to document that. Uh, a few other things, kind of odds and ends. Uh, we have a simplified new expression. So this code example that I have here, person X uh, called X equals new person X. I can now write this shorthand like you see it here. So it's, it's almost, I like to think of it as the opposite of the var keyword. The var keyword implied the type on the left side of the expression. The new open close parentheses implies the type on the right side of the expression. Uh, which is very cool if you call, for instance, a method and that method has five parameters and there are objects that you need to instantiate and you're like, oh, I don't know where those objects are and you need to do the right using statement and so on. Now you can just say new and it news up a default one for those guys. Uh, so that's kind of nifty and also works really well in conjunction with uh, records. Um, and there's a few other things like... Uh, uh, the ability to do static lambdas, uh, discard parameters, and so on. They're just useful features and has uh, a fair number of these specific features. These are, to me, the most useful ones that are picked out here. But, you know, uh, C Sharp 9 is what you would expect from, C from a future version of C Sharp. It's just an improved version. Uh, a few questions. Are records allocated on the stack? They are allocated like reference types in that sense. So heap allocation and garbage collection. Uh, can you use cast? Yeah, you can cast them. They, they support full inheritance. Uh, they do support functions. Uh, as you saw in the last statement, I think we talked about that. Uh, new object comparison and link to objects. If you do link to records, then yes, it should work. And that's one of the common scenarios, in fact. Uh, can record comparison be changed so that string comparison is case insensitive? That's interesting. It doesn't do that out of the box, but you could all overwrite the operator and make it do that if you want, but then you're on your own doing the whole comparison. Don't you get problems with interfaces or abstract classes? Uh, 
we'd have to specifically look into what uh, they might be. Uh, record is different. Uh, well, no, that they're, they're, they're different from structs. Uh, they're not value types. They're more like reference types that are immutable and behave like value types. So that was the pain point that was there. If you wanted a reference type that you could handle more like a, uh, a value type, which is very useful for data comparisons, for instance, and make it immutable for async processing. That was difficult before, and that's what this solves. The reason to create an empty record, mm, I guess you might sometimes need those and then start muting them by, by copying the object. Uh, can you pass a record to a class? Yeah, it's an object in that sense. You can pass it around. Uh, and they can have, a, I'd have, I'd have to try that out, but I believe they can have static methods. I don't see why not. Uh, and then there's a, a little bit of a different question now, which says, uh, why would you use var in C sharp? That has nothing to do with C sharp nine, which is a general C sharp question. Uh, var does not weaken typing. It just lets the compiler figure it out. So if I say var x equals new person, it's still strongly typed as a person. It just does the text replacement for you. Okay. So anyway, let's move along. F sharp. F sharp five has been improved a great deal. It was very important to make F sharp a first class citizen in .NET 5. Uh, and that includes a few things such as full support for F sharp interactive, which is very popular and was never really supported in core. Uh, full support for package managers. If you want to play in a modern environment and you don't support package managers like NuGet, that's a problem. And that was a huge pain point in F sharp. Uh, then, of course, we have things like the Jupyter Notebooks, the Visual Studio Notebooks, uh, running in analytical programming, machine learning, all those things that are, are really useful these days. All of those have been added to uh, F-sharp to make it a true first-class citizen. Now, again, this I could do a whole session on, or I'm not the F-sharp expert, but somebody could. Uh, and we probably will do that in the future uh, in, a, in a new webinar series that we will announce shortly uh, so so that's very interesting but just a quick note that this has been improved greatly and if you're a data scientist or anything like that you will love this stuff functional programming if you enjoy that uh, having f sharp 5 as a first class citizen in dotnet 5 is uh, very important All right, uh, moving along into a different area. I know there's some other questions online, but we're running really short on time because I, I entertain so many questions. Um, but I'll stick around after the time is up and answer more questions. Um, I want to talk briefly about Windows development. I know we had some questions early about that. The key point to understand, WPF and WinForms are supported as first-class citizens in .NET 5. So in 3.1, .NET Core 3.1, it was a huge step forward to get support for these platforms because it got us out of this dead end that it would have been if it was just on the full framework. So they moved into .NET Core 3.1. WPF and SAML dialects had limited designer support in 3.1 even. WinForms had no designer support, but you could run it. Now, both of them enjoy full support from the designer. So just dipping back into Visual Studio here for one brief moment, and we'll go back to this, uh, where is it? Let's get my mouse back from the other screen. And just into a Windows app here. Whatever. Um, here is my form one, which is a standard Windows form form, and it's still loading the solution here, but it'll come up in a moment. And you'll see that now there's full designer support the way you're used to it. In fact, it's not just a moving into this new world, but they actually enhance the designer a little bit as well. Uh, and so you get full support for that. You get full support for the toolbox. In short, you can do 
wind forms development you can do wpf development the way you're used to it plus it supports all the new things like saml islands uh win ui 3.0 once that's fully finished win ui 2.0 is all supported in this uh in this designer support uh is wpf and WinForms supported for non-microsoft languages is a question online well i guess you could finagle it but there's nothing specific in visual studio so i mean you could create the source code in a different language and if they have a compiler to .NET 5 then that would work but realistically speaking it's mostly a C-sharp affair. Um, what else we have click one support that was lacking in .NET Core 3.1 that's now they are fully supported so as you can see we are really getting to a point where this is now just where we want to be it's, it's fully supported and it's there. Uh, one interesting feature I want to point out is WebView 2 WebView 2 is a control that you can use, but it's a super significant control because it's the ability to host HTML inside of WinForms, inside of WPF, and inside of other things. Um, we'll even eventually go into C++ and so on. And why is this significant? Well, we had an older WebView control that was Internet Explorer based. Well, that wasn't great, and I don't have to tell you why. And what this is now, it's an edge Chromium based HTML control. So in essence, you now have a Chromium engine as a simple control called WebView 2 inside a WinForms WPF and, and other Windows applications. And it's cool that this is supported on the full .NET framework, .NET Core 3X and .NET 5, which means you can even deploy it to Windows 7 and later. So it doesn't have to be uh, Windows 10, which is uh, cool. And it's evergreen, so it's updated about roughly every six weeks and will always have the newest Chromium features. And so in short, you now have a modern way to embed modern HTML inside of your desktop applications. WinUI 3, brief mention, it's a continuation of WinRT, SAML Islands, uh, UWP, all that sort of stuff, Fluent UI. It's actually very cool what it can do. Uh, but it's based on Windows 10 only. Um, that's currently available as a preview, will not ship as such with .NET 5. It's a little bit of an out-of-band thing, but it's available as a preview. And it's very well supported on top of the other desktop platforms as long as you are on Windows 10. Um, and it comes to more platforms. So previously it was just the uh, WinForms and WPF. Now it will also go even to uh, uh, C++ and things like that. So that's been popular because cool controls are available and you can now move them into these older existing apps um, and, and gain those benefits. Samarin forms, uh, that will be an interesting topic moving forward. They have interesting improvements, mainly for the Surface Duo device, uh, things like dark mode, improved design time support, Samarin forms will uh, morph into Maui and will have, would be interesting to see what the Samarin team tells us about all that. But um, right now it's in .NET 5, it's relatively limited what their news are, but you know, it's more the incremental update. So that's it about desktop and mobile development. And again, lots of interesting things will come after the .NET 5 release and into the .NET 6 timeframe, the next year will be very interesting for that type of stuff. And this was something that I'm sure Microsoft wanted to get in for .NET 5, but it's proved to be a lot of work. So, so it'll be released gradually. For web development, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, we've had recently a state of .NET focusing just on that. That recording is available. Go take a look at this. What is important to know is that Blazor is kind of the big news also .NET 5 has been enhanced now fully running on the .NET 5 runtime even in the browser moving away from the mono runtime drastic performance improvements uh, component rendering two to four times faster uh, computational performance much faster uh, there's a pre-rendering feature that's very cool that fixes one of the biggest problems uh, that we had with Blazor which was the initial load time for a first time load uh, also helps with search optimization and then there's just a bunch of other features so this is clearly very interesting um, we will I'm sure focus on Blazor in itself again because that has been a super popular topic uh, with the viewers so just 
to be aware, I was debating of not even mentioning this here today because I would love to spend more time on, on ASP.NET improvements and Blaze improvements. But we've talked so much about that anyway. I just wanted to get that in there so you know just in general that there's certainly a lot of development in that area. And, you know, .NET Conf is three days of content. I'm sure they have a lot of content about Blazor and .NET 5 there as well. So, so just be aware of that. Uh, question online, is .NET supported on UWP? UWP is also morphing into .NET 5, so it's kind of the opposite, right? You can't just reference a, a .NET 5 package from UWP, but UWP is moving uh, to .NET 5 with the WinUI 3 version of that. All right, and that brings us to the end of the main content. I'm already way out of time. Uh, There's just so much stuff to talk about, so much I would have loved to have talked about that we didn't have uh, time for today. That's why we are going to do a review after .NET Conf as well. Just a few other announcements. Again, Jim already told you about that. We are asking you for your feedback. Tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, it's a very short survey. It doesn't take any time at all, and it helps us to fine-tune and, and plan future events. Uh, so let us know what you think. Again, if you're wondering how any of this applies to your concept, consider us a resource. I always tell people we're not the kind of company that will send you a, uh, a, a bill for an hour of consulting. We do this entirely free and then, you know, we don't expect anything more to come of it. Um, and a lot of people have been starting to take us up on that offer. And uh, we've looked at some very cool scenarios. Always interesting to see what people do. So, so consider that as an option that you have. Uh, also, I want to draw your attention to the Code Mobile app, especially because of our upcoming Code Focus magazine. Right now, due to the Corona crisis, we're still giving away all our content for free on the, on the mobile app. That's the easiest way for us to get it out to people. And people have been taking advantage of that. And we'll continue doing that uh, for a while as this crisis is going on. So, uh, you know, it looks like more and more people are going on lockdown again. And I'm happy to, to have something to learn and do and read. And this is one way of how we want to support the community. And pass this on to your friends. Uh, there's actually a, a link to a free subscription to get people started on, on this as well. So they can just get a free subscription and read all our content for free currently. It's a limited time offer. We will eventually turn it off again once the crisis has passed but right now that's how it works um, if you're a visual studio customer uh, of microsoft they are extending we have, we have a partnership with them where we are basically getting a code magazine subscription free of charge courtesy of microsoft whether you are a paid subscri uh, subscriber a vss subscriber or whether you use their free dev essentials versions uh, Microsoft always gives you a free subscription. So if you have friends that are interested in that, potentially point them to that and they get some free stuff there as well. Now the next Stata.net event, again, I already referred to it a few times, will be a review of what's going on in .NET 5 and will give us an opportunity to dig deeper into some of those areas. And I'm sure some of this stuff will uh, fill the next few months. Uh, this event is November 18th. It's a little bit earlier than usual. Normally we're doing the last Wednesday of the month. That would get us into Thanksgiving. We don't want that. So it's going to be a week earlier. And then probably the following month with Christmas, we'll have the same deal. Uh, so mark your calendars. That will be diving in depth into some of those features that we were only able to scratch the surface on today. And again, check out .NET Conf. .NET Conf .net is the URL free and tons and tons of, of content. I, looking at the schedule, it's actually going to be almost a 24-7 type of affair or 24-3, I should say. Uh, so, so cool stuff going on and check that out. And that brings us to the end. I'm going to stick around for a little bit longer because we still have um, questions online. I know I'm already way out of time, so we'll conclude this part of the presentation. And I apologize for going uh, over time, but I think there's lots of cool stuff going on. It's well worth uh, spending a little bit of extra time. Contact us if you have questions and, and we'll end the recording at this point. But I will keep streaming and I will answer a few more questions that we had there. Um, one question is, is managed C++ going away or dead with .NET 5? 
Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so watch.net conf, maybe there'll be announcements there. So not something I can talk about here. Another question is, can a record inherit from a class? No, records are different in that sense, right? So records inherit from records, classes from classes. Um, are they going to kill, are records going to kill read-only structs? No, I don't think so, because structs are meant for something smaller. There's some that's uh, just allocated more efficiently in memory. Uh, and so that's still going to stick around. It's also important for interop and... Uh, uh, that's actually been enhanced as well, by the way. I didn't have time to talk about that today, but low-level interop, with, especially around structs and passing values, has, uh, has been enhanced. And I think the other questions there I already answered. And there was a question further up uh, about, do I recommend gRPC as a replacement for WCF? Uh, so we're essentially talking, uh, there's nothing to do with .NET 5, just in general. GRPC support was introduced with uh, Core 3.x and it's a cool binary standard to do very efficient uh, API calls or service calls. And so, yeah, it is an interesting replacement for WCF. Now, have we gone that route? Well, we actually went replacing WCF with REST uh, and JSON calls, but the infrastructure that we have with Code Framework and its service and API infrastructure uh, allows us to interchangeably go to both. So that's that's kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, it is a perfectly viable replacement. But I would recommend making some, making an architecture where you're not pigeonholed in one or the other and kind of the out-of-the-box stuff uh, pigeonholes you into that. And then there was another question further up. Uh, are we also shipping the focus issue uh, to customers in Europe? And the short answer to that is yes. Well, uh, like I said, it's a first-come, first-serve basis. So... Uh, we will service all the print subscribers first. So if you already get a print issue, no matter where you are, you're going to get it. And then beyond that, we'll ship it to digital subscribers. So if you're a digital subscriber in Europe, depends on whether we run out or not. But regardless, you'll have access to it in digital form uh, in various ways anyway. Um, another question uh, that we have is, will .NET move away from uh, XML config to YAML and JSON? Uh, it depends on what you're doing, really. So the project files you saw, for instance, they're still XML-based, and that's that. But then uh, other uh, things use JSON for that. So, for instance, package config is a JSON file, and you know, then you have things like editor config. And uh, so JSON, I do see happening somewhat. I think XML and JSON will stick around. I haven't seen YAML used for that all that much uh, in .NET but uh, wouldn't rule it out, but it's not something that I've seen that much. Uh, and then as a question, is there any kind of interop on Linux uh, or Mac? And well, that depends on what you're doing exactly. So for instance, if you're building uh, a Mac application that's supposed to have a UI, uh, then you need to use something like Xamarin and their extension. So it's not just a .NET 5 app, but it would be a .NET 5 iOS or Mac or whatever app. And then they interop and give you ways to interop into into the Mac, uh, like UI kit or whatever you, you want to use. And so, yes, there is those types of interop things uh, available in those platforms. Okay, and I think that pretty much gives us, uh, that, that was all the questions we had. And if there's no more questions, then thank you very much for attending. Feel free to contact me afterwards or contact us, send us email, and we'd be happy uh, to answer those questions. And you'll also receive a follow-up email with links to the recording and links to the slide deck. Uh, so you can get that as well. So thank you very much and pass this on to your friends. Get your Code Focus magazine, download .NET 5, and I hope to see you both at .NET Conf as well as at the next State of .NET. Thank you very much.